So, um, it's really nice uh, to be here. Um, this is where I currently live. I have to correct Paul with one thing. I did my GP training here. So I was in, in the northeast from 1985 to 1989, uh, before I moved up to Aberdeen. And I was in Aberdeen until 2002 when I moved to Canada, to Ottawa. Uh, and this is what Ottawa was like about two months ago. Uh, if you've not been there, Ottawa is the federal capital of Canada, a very nice place to live. But we have a canal that runs through the city. And in the winter, they drop the level, they let it freeze, and everyone goes and skates on the canal. So um, you have to have some compensations if you're living in a country that's white from January to uh, April, and this is one of ours. So I'm very pleased to be here. Um, um, as I said, I, I um, um, trained as a GP. Uh, and then went and did a PhD in health services research in Aberdeen. And my PhD was looking at how to improve referrals from family doctors to specialists. Um, you'll see I also switched between North American and the UK language, so I apologize for that, but hopefully it's, it's not too bad. Um, so I tested four interventions, none of them worked. Um, um, I think it's still really hard to think about how we improve the referral system. Um, um, uh, but that led into an, an ongoing interest about how do we support healthcare professionals and healthcare systems to use evidence better to, provide, uh, to improve the care that we provide patients and also uh, improve patient outcomes and use of resources. So hopefully that's um, a, a bit of an introduction for myself. And now um, Justin's going to tell us a bit about um, um, his self. So I've, come, I've gone east to west and uh, Justin will tell us about uh, his journey. <laughs> so yeah, uh, greetings from Newcastle, which is a little less white, a little sunnier, particularly on Great North Run days. Um, so greetings from Newcastle from, he says, with a clearly Canadian accent. And indeed, I'm from, <laughs> I'm actually originally trained as a psychologist in Ottawa, um, where I did my undergrad, um, and then was interested in, in just pursuing more um, post-grad work, so I ended up in Aberdeen to do my master's and PhD before coming down to Newcastle to uh, take on a lectureship in, in health psychology at uh, Newcastle University. And so really, what I'm really interested in is how can we draw on psychology, and particularly behavioral science and principles of what we've learned about how people change their behaviors and actually apply it to the context of implementation science and how we actually improve the quality of care. Um, so that's, I think, me in a nutshell. Um, but we've deliberately, in the spirit of, of this, the, the collaborative nature of this partnership, deliberately split you up into people you may or may not know. So we thought it might be useful to spend a couple of minutes just getting to know each other if you haven't had a chance already. Just with the people next to you at your tables, just introduce yourselves, talk about who you are, your background, and particularly what you want to get out of this course. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to do that, um, and then we'll kick off with the, the first session. So, so what we're trying to do today is give you kind of quite a high level, you know, a, a cut across, really thinking about um, implementation, particularly using behavioral and organizational perspectives. And this is a program for the day. Uh, you know, for virtually any of these sessions, we could have broken this out and done a full day's work. So see this as kind of a very sort of, you know, high level sort of perspective. What we've done is structure the day so there's, off, there's a sort of content um, um, presentation that um, either myself or Justin will give, and then uh, basically a task that we want you to play with, okay? Um, there's, the timing of the day is kind of quite tight. There's a lot of stuff to get through. Um, if there are really burning issues, uh, then please sort of interrupt and say, I don't kind of get that, I don't understand, or I, I disagree with you. Um, but we're gonna have to be kind of quite tight with time and, uh, uh, um, and we'll work quite quickly through things. Uh, but this is kind of what we hope to get to the day and uh, we promise you we will finish by uh, 4.30. Um, the other thing to say is it's really great to see so many people in a when it's um, um, half term and you've probably got a variety of family commitments, although um, I'm sure it's probably better spending a day in here with Justin and I than having to take your kids outside on a day like today. So uh, may, may, maybe, uh, maybe the gods have, 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 have somehow balanced the scales. Mm -hmm. oh, okay, there we go. Okay, so um, this first session is really sort of uh, um, 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 largely introducing you some core concepts and also talking about um, what's uh, the knowledge creation kind of with that funnel, but that's largely talking about if we want to try and implement evidence-based practices, what sort of evidence should we be trying to base our, or, or trying to change practice to? Uh, and this is really the challenge that I think healthcare systems and societies around the world face. Um, we really value health. We invest heavily in healthcare systems and we invest heavily in uh, health research. And I think the reason we invest in research is we hope that it will lead to improvements in the quality of care that our patients get, 
uh, and their productivity length of life. Um, but if you actually look at uh, um, uh, or, or, or look at what we're doing at the moment, arguably a lot of the money we invest in research is wasted because we then don't make sure that that research is taken up in healthcare systems. So even if we have knowledge about how to improve care, our patients are not benefiting from that. And Steve Wolf is a family physician in the US and he did a very nice academic piece in the Annals of Family Practice about the need to invest at least as much in the implementation as the original research. Um, but he then did an op a Washington Post uh, opinion piece and the sub-editor gave him this great um, um, title, All Breakthrough, No Follow-Through. And I think if you look globally, uh, virtually all healthcare systems, if not all of them are struggling with this. I would say from outside the UK, that the UK is probably doing more than most healthcare systems to try and bridge this. But one of the issues is how do you make sure that you're most effective as you're trying to, um, uh, uh, trying to, to do that. Here's just another way of looking at it. This was an Institute of Medicine roundtable uh, published in 2003. And they were, uh, again, interested in how do we maximize the benefit from research. And they pointed out there were two sort of blocks. One was this um, um, block from translation of evidence from basic sciences to human studies. We have some really um, um, interesting ideas about uh, how we may be able to modify disease based upon uh, animal studies. But um, we're not actually then introducing them to human studies. But we're really talking about this area here. Um, we kind of have a good sense about what to do from clinical and health services research, population health research, um, but we're just not managing to get those into practice and policy. Um, and this is the problem that we're trying to deal with. If you look around the world, in virtually every healthcare system, in virtually every area of endeavor, uh, there's evidence that healthcare professionals and healthcare systems do not achieve the levels of quality of care that they would aspire to. People go into healthcare because they see the social value, certainly in a country like the UK, about you know, what they're doing. They want to do good. Um, but actually, uh, um, we don't do, uh, even though we have high ideals, we don't achieve those. So a consistent study shows that uh, between 30 to 40% of patients don't get tro uh, treatments of proven effectiveness, and around 20 to 25% of patients get care that's either not needed or is potentially harmful. And this is, a this is a consistent finding in the UK, in Canada, but in Europe, in the rest of North America, in China, in, uh, in, uh, in Africa. And I think the fact that no, you can't go to any healthcare system and say, they got it right, is an indication that this is actually a really complex task. You know, it's not that someone over there has solved it and we're just being a bit slow because we haven't picked up on that. This is one of the really fundamental challenge to healthcare systems. And it probably reflects both the complexity of healthcare um, uh, um, um, and also the kind of uh, complex, increasing complexity of our patients and the complexity of healthcare systems and particularly the kind of intersectoral relationships. So I would, suge I, mean, I would suggest that implementation of evidence-based care is a fundamental challenge for healthcare systems that are interested in optimizing um, care, outcomes, and costs. Uh, and there's nowhere in the world you can go to and say, they've got this right. Um, there are some high-performing healthcare systems, but even if you go to those, say, in North America, like the VA or Kaiser, they would say they're struggling with this, okay? So the good thing is we shouldn't feel that bad that you know, this is actually a difficult task that we have to try and take on and not think that uh, we should have cracked it by now. So um, um, uh, um, I'm aware that this is the kind of um, high hegen table, um, using my Scottish uh, vernacular. Um, 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 so I'm going to look this way, because um, I don't know how in the Northeast you'd say you do this. But yeah, if you want to sort of stereotype how do healthcare organizations currently try and address these issues, there are a number of ways that they typically do. First is they issue guidance. Every physician should wash their hands um, before they see a patient or before patient contact. Um, that's great, it's often good to know what you should do, but we also know that actually uh, there are many sort of um, um, uh, um, areas where just the existence of guidance doesn't necessarily mean that people then follow what might be done. The second is that um, you know, you know, we develop internal solutions. So uh, um, many people in the room might know Martin Eccles. Um, he retired a couple of years ago to become a, a wastrel art student. Um, but one of the things he, he reflected upon was that uh, if you look at how often organizations think about um, um, improving the care they provide, they, they, they use the, uh, the ISGLIAT principle. So do people know what the ISGLIAT principle is? 
So often what you have is a, you know, a, a group, a task force pulled together to think about um, you know, how we're going to address this problem. Um, and you often have a lot of experience and expertise in the room. Um, but often, uh, basically, whoever's talking loudest or longest, that's kind of what wins the day. And sometimes, yeah, we, we come on solutions that are great. Other times, we choose solutions that when we actually try and implement them, we can't do them, or they don't get the benefit that we want. Okay? And one of the things that Justin and I are going to be arguing uh, uh, for today is, yeah, I think what we need to do is start to be more systematic in our way about how we develop implementation programs um, um, using a broad range of knowledge that can help us with that. One of the other challenges about this is that um, if you go into a room with people, they all have pretty strong beliefs about how to change behavior. And that may be based upon their own expertise. So I'm an epidemiologist, so I think we just have to give better evidence and uh, people are rational people and they'll just follow through what they should do. Um, I'm a manager, I think we need to look at the work processes and understand how the work process influences the behaviors and what we can do is change the work processes. I'm a senior policymaker, we want to change the remuneration systems because you know, those are the tools that I, I'm aware of and feel comfortable with. And so the problem is that um, what you find is that you know, lots of people have got strong beliefs um, and, they're not, and they often get fixated on those. And so if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Uh, and the problem is that um, you know, what we need is a much to recognize is there are many different types of things we're trying to achieve, and we need a much broader toolkit, okay? Uh, and we need to get away from the idea that um, um, yeah, the way to fix this is that we just need to change reimbursement systems, or the way to fix this is to issue guidance, but rather to understand you know, what is the problem we're trying to fix, and given that, you know, what tool should we actually use? Now, Justin is the only person in this room that will actually appreciate this. Uh, and this slide was largely created so that I could have a Lee Valley catalog um, in, uh, a, 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 in, a, in a presentation. Lee Valley is a very high-end producer of tools in Canada, um, um, and they have a, a, you know, a series of very nice catalogs. Um, unfortunately, I'm the least handy person you've ever met in your life, so in practical terms, this doesn't help me at all. But... Um, so sometimes we have internal solutions, sometimes we try and bring out inside, uh, um, external solutions from outside. And there are lots of people that will come and tell the healthcare system, we know how to solve your problems, and all you have to do is X, Y, or Z, and that will solve your problems. And often, um, um, you know, consultants and other things cost a fair amount of resource. So this is a, an example of a project that people might be aware of. Um, it was the uh, Safety Patient Initiative Program. The Health Foundation was very keen to try and bring this from the US to the UK. They asked for volunteer um, hospitals. I have no idea, I should have checked whether any were in the Northeast, I have no idea. Um, but they chose four hospitals, Keener hospitals, who sort of said basically, we're ready to go with this, we think this is gonna solve our quality problems, and and um, um, you know, let's go. Uh, and um, um, they gave each of those hospitals around about 775,000 pounds in a year to try and improve the safety of care that they've got. Now, Richard Lilford and colleagues wanted to evaluate that. And often when we use these external solutions, we, we don't particularly evaluate them using very robust ways, and so we don't necessarily learn from this. But uh, Richard and colleagues, I think, identified 18 hospitals which were kind of similar to the, uh, to the intervention hospitals and found that despite um, uh, that investment of almost uh, uh, or three quarters of a million pounds, um, really there's no obvious improvement in the intervention hospitals compared to the control hospitals. And the problem here is that that is then lost resource. Fortunately, the Health Foundation had given this money to the hospital, but if these hospitals had chosen to use their own quality budgets to achieve this, the, the, there'd be an opportunity cost. They'd have wasted that resource. They couldn't use it elsewhere. And so I think this you know, means that we have to be very critical users of, 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 of implementation approaches. And where, where possible, we might want to try and either, you know, even low-level evaluations, see whether we're getting a good return on the investment that we're putting in. Uh, healthcare, the healthcare system budget is huge, but the budget that most organizations have for actual quality is relatively small. And so it means we have to be really very thoughtful about how we get the best out of that budget. Uh, and here's, I mean, and the final thing I'd say is you throw everything at the problem. 
So one of the um, um, issues, if you look at say, uh, uh, the literature on how do you improve quality of care, um, people say if you do multifaceted interventions, you're going to get a larger effect than single interventions. So if you do uh, um, an intervention that's got three or four different components, it's going to be more effective than a single uh, component intervention. And that's been a kind of mantra that's actually still repeated. But we were able to test this in a, um, uh, a, a study in 2004 that looked at guideline studies published from 1976 through to 1998, uh, 1999 rather. Uh, and what you have here is basically these are studies that have one component, two component, three component, four component, more than four. And this is a box and whisker plot. So the, the, av the, the line in the middle is the average effect seen across those stu uh, these studies. And this gives you an idea about the spread of results. Now, if multifast interventions were more likely effective than single interventions, you'd expect a dose response curve. So, as you go from one intervention to two into component interventions to three component interventions to four, you get large effects. And hopefully, you can see here that there's really no suggestion that that's the case. And we've just, we're just finishing, or we've just finished a, 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 a review of reviews of, of, inter, of, of studies that have tried to look at this, and again found that at the moment, given the way people are putting interventions together, there's really no compelling evidence that doing more necessarily gives you a larger effect. Now, when we first published this, um, 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 a colleague said it was like killing sacred cows that you had raised in your own garden. This was such a strongly held belief that, the, and, and, it, and the reason is there's a huge amount of face validity. Yeah, we recognize there are multiple barriers uh, to implementation, and therefore, if you do more that might address different barriers, then you're likely going to get a better return on that. The problem is, if you actually look at the way in which people choose what interventions to deliver, um, there doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason. It's not that people developed a very careful um, um, a, a, a program where we're going to target knowledge gaps with this issue, we're going to target skill gaps with issues, this issue, we're going to change work process over here. They just throw anything they can conceivably think at the problem. And you'd have studies where there were three different educational interventions where there's no suggestion that the fundamental problem that people were trying to address was professional's knowledge. So, I think one of the challenges is that if we just largely use a what you know, very practical approach of this is what we can throw at the problem, we're not necessarily going to get an increased benefit from the resources that we, uh, uh, that we put in. Um, it doesn't mean that if we do develop a more systematic approach and we have a really good program logic and we really understand what we're trying to do and we can carefully put together an intervention that we won't necessarily get a large effect. Um, but this is kind of at the moment, if you look at how people develop interventions, you don't necessarily get a large effect. So um, I would argue that to date, many organizations responses to this problem implementation have failed to achieve optimal care despite considerable investments. Most often, these approaches to changing care are based on the beliefs of the actors rather than scientific evidence. And Richard Colley, uh, Grawl, a Dutch colleague in 1997, said evidence-based medicine should be complemented by evidence-based implementation. So when we're thinking about evidence-based medicine, we use very robust methods to say, what's the evidence about uh, what we should be doing uh, in terms of clinical care? The same if we think about implementation. What does the evidence tell us about you know, how we might be able to improve implementation? Um, it, you know, I think we still have uh, uh, to get um, um, the still off of art of what we do, but actually there's a knowledge base out there that we can potentially use. So can we do better? Well, undoubtedly, perhaps. We'll see. Um, I would argue that implementation is about ensuring that stakeholders are aware of and use research evidence to inform their decision making and actions to improve processes and outcomes of care. Okay, so it's really about you explicitly using evidence to think about both what care we should provide and how we might improve care. And I, I think we need three different types of knowledge if we want to improve care. We need internal knowledge, which might be about our performance data, the tacit knowledge of players in an organization who understand um, the politics, the practicalities, the constraints an organization may have. But we also need external knowledge. We have um, a, a lot of knowledge from clinical and implementation science that can actually inform uh, us how to um, 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 uh, likely improve quality of care. Uh, there are a whole range of things that psychologists would argue might improve quality of care or improve uh, uh, behavior change that I, as a non-psychologist, um, before I started to engage uh, with psychologists, didn't believe. But there are now multiple randomized controlled trials showing that if you get, for, for example, general practitioners to sign a commitment to change after CME activity, they're more likely to change their behavior than if you don't get them to sign a commitment to change. 
It's a very simple thing to do, and I would have thought, um, you know, I've trained as a family doc, but you know, I'd have probably been a bit offended about sort of being asked to do this. But actually, people will often play, and if they do, there's actually quite a lot of psychological um, evidence and theory about why they'll actually move forward. So there's external knowledge we can use that I don't think, with, from our internal knowledge, we'd necessarily ever come up with. And then we need behavior and organizational change and expertise. Now again, I don't know what it's like here. When I travel around the world and when I think about what happens in Canada, in my own hospital, we, are, we have a really good quality group, a very committed, dedicated, often senior healthcare professionals who've moved into quality. They might have been trained in sort of um, some CQI approaches, um, um, but that's all we do. So we largely focus on that internal uh, um, component and we haven't built the expertise in the organization to use these other types of knowledge. And I think we need all three if we're gonna move things forward. So um, again, this is, uh, um, 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 you know, I occasionally just want to put graphics into presentations, uh, but Malcolm X talked about by all means necessary, and I think we have to think about quality in that way uh, and not be constrained in terms of, well, this is kind of what quality groups do, virtually what are the tools that we have uh, and that we can bring to bear in the solution, how do we coordinate those and how do we get the best uh, return? So trying to use all the tools and levers at, at our disposal. So where does implementation science come through? Well, implementation is a human enterprise that we can study to understand and improve implementation approaches. So implementation science is the scientific study of the determinants process and outcomes of implementation. And the goal is to develop a generalizable empirical and theoretical basis to optimize implementation activities. Uh, one of the challenges in the area is just terminology. And I apologize. I've been kind of working in the area for sort of like 25 years, but these are all synonyms um, that people use for this area. So uh, um, you might talk about knowledge, in Canada we talk about knowledge translation. In the US you talk about dissemination, or they talk about dissemination implementation. And one of the problems about this kind of different sort of uh, siloing or, or different language is it's really confusing for the end user. But I would still argue that what you want to do is sort of try and identify knowledge that can help you do a better job at what you're trying to do on a day-to-day -day basis. And don't worry too much about, in Canada we call this knowledge translation, in, uh, in, in Australia we call it research translation. Doesn't really matter, okay? Don't get hung up on the language. And this is kind of, I mean, this is a really just nice, uh, almost an aside, a case study, which is sort of talking about um, some of the, or, or some of the implications of this sort of really um, um, not very helpful uh, 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 um, um, profusion of language. So people may know Kieran Walsh, he's uh, at the Manchester Business School. Um, he did a really nice study where he just started to sort of look at uh, um, papers published in PubMed uh, um, 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 and look at the language used in terms of quality improvement terms. So what you can see from this is that in the early 1990s, everyone was talking about medical audit. And then 90, in the mid-1990s, that was, what was that would have been? I think that was clinical audit. Then you had clinical governance. Then you had lean and, and, now, and six sigma patient safety. And what you can see are these waves of you know, initially a lot of interest and then a decay. And one of the things that Kieran observed is actually there's probably more that in common across these approaches and there's differences. But because we constantly reinvent quality approaches, we kind of start, yeah, we, we, it's almost like we're starting afresh. So Lee and the Six Sigma can't learn from clinical governance, where actually there's lots of kind of commonalities and maybe additional approaches that one can do. So Kieran said, the repeated presentation of an essentially similar set of QI ideas and methods under different names and uh, terminologies is a process of pseudo-innovation that can be driven by both incentives for QI methodology developers um, and also the demands and expectations of those responsible for QI in healthcare organizations. But this has important disbenefits because it, it starts to sort of say, we, yeah, we have to start afresh with a fresh field as opposed to actually we've been working in quality for the last 20 years, we've learned a lot. What are the additional insights that maybe the new um, techniques or perspectives that Six Sigma might bring in, but that should build upon what we've already learned to date or our skill set that we have. So interdisciplinary science is, is, a, is a, a relatively new field of health research. Um, I've been working in the field for 25 years, but there's probably um, you know, less than 
a couple of dozen people around the world that you could say the same of. It's inherently interdisciplinary. Yeah, I, I conceptualize this about changing behaviors in complex systems, and there are a wide range of disciplines that can actually teach us about that, and we should be celebrating that and trying to use that. So I think we need uh, uh, clinical health service research, social sciences, design and engineering. Um, we have lots of issues around how engineers think about design of programs that are really helpful for the way we think about this. Um, and we need a broad range of forms of inquiry. So a lot of my work has been doing large scale randomized control trials where we randomize all the practices in the northeast of Scotland and northeast of England, for example. So I'm very much a trialist, but actually there's, a, there's we also need sort of um, um, research which is going to be much more qualitative and nuanced and focused. So we need all of these things. This is my list of what implementation science is. I'm really not going to go through this in any great detail, but just to highlight again, there's actually a lot of different information that we might need. Um, some of this sort of, for example, research into knowledge retrieval, evaluation, knowledge management infrastructure. You know, how do organizations um, actually develop the infrastructure to ensure that they are good users of, of evidence? We'll touch about that a little bit, um, as well as sort of how do we uh, um, um, assess barriers and facilitators. We're going to use this as a model. Um, all models are wrong, some are useful. Uh, this is a model developed by a colleague, Ian Graham, who's a sociologist in Ottawa. Uh, he developed this model by looking at 33 <laughs> plan change mo uh, um, uh, models from a broad range of disciplines and found, despite there being 33 models, uh, in general what you had was a lot of common ideas across them. So when I want to tease him, I said he developed the 34th model. Um, but basically, uh, this is a model that says, yeah, there's, there's a couple of things we need to think about. This is a knowledge creation funnel, which is about what is the knowledge we should be trying to think about uh, changing clinical care about. Uh, um, and it largely argues, um, to give you the punchline, that we should be focusing on guidelines or other evidence-based guidance rather than expecting that healthcare professionals or healthcare systems should be able to be used as a primary knowledge. But it also says the generation of that guidance is not sufficient by itself, and the outer circle is basically a planned process that if you go through things in a systematic way, you're more likely to get improvements in the care that you're, you're trying to achieve. So we're going to talk a little bit about the knowledge creation um, funnel. Um, I mean, in the UK, uh, you know, and clearly I think the, the aim of, uh, of, of NECWAS is around particularly implementing nice guidance. The UK has, uh, or England, um, has a Rolls Royce um, evidence-based guidance development system compared to anywhere else around the world. So to some extent, the bottom line here is that actually NICE should be a major driver of the kind of care that's provided. Um, but I'll, I'll talk through a little a bit of the other things. So some of the challenges are that, um, you know, at the moment there's probably about 20,000 health journals published each year. Uh, and if you ask healthcare professionals and managers, normally they'd say they have less than one hour a week to actually keep up to date with the medical literature or the health literature. So you can see there's an immediate, so if, we ex if the expectations that healthcare professionals can somehow manage their knowledge, um, the, the, it's clearly unrealistic because there's too much knowledge and healthcare professionals are um, uh, 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 really busy, as are managers. Um, and the published research, unfortunately, is variable quality and relevance. And research users um, are often poorly trained in critical appraisal skills. So the good thing is I didn't train in Newcastle, I trained in Edinburgh. And when I did my medical degree in 1979, there were four lectures in medical statistics. And they weren't mandatory. So I went to the first one where they taught me how to do a chi-square test by hand and decided I could sleep in for the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the lecture series. Um, yeah, and if I was in practice, I would still be in practice for another 10 or 15 years. Pro professional programs are much better, much more evidence-based now, but there are many people who, go, who are healthcare professionals out there that have really not had very much formal training. Or even if they've had training, by the time they get into service and they've been working for five years, you know, the skills they may have developed as an undergraduate or uh, um, in their professional training probably atrophy. So again, often the users are not great users of knowledge. And probably most importantly, individual studies rarely by themselves provide sufficient evidence for policy or practice change. Even though it's really attractive that there's uh, something on um, um, you know, the BBC News about uh, this study showing X, it's very unusual for a single study to be persuasive that we should change our policy and practice. And to give you um, an example of that, uh, um, um, this is a paper that published in JAMA by uh, someone called Johnny Inardis. John is um, a Greek god. He is a real hero of mine. He's one of the nicest people you'll meet. 
um, but he publishes about 3,000 papers a day. Uh, and the, the problem is that most of them are actually worth reading. Um, but in this paper, he wanted to ask the question, are there any single studies that we should believe? Okay, any primary studies that we should believe? So what he's, his argument was, well, maybe if you look at those studies that are published in the major medical journals like um, uh, Lancet, BMJ, JAMA, New England Medicine, maybe they're likely to be trustworthy. But he then put an additional barrier that said, maybe we should look at studies that are highly cited. So studies that had more than 1,000 citations. So this is, there have been other papers to refer, more than 1,000 other papers to refer to these papers, okay? Um, just as a, as a sort of, I, I sometimes do this as a pop quiz, the median number of citations for any academic paper is zero. Okay? So in general, um, at least half of the, uh, the academic papers that are published are never cited by anyone else. Something that's been cited by more than a thousand other papers is in the top 1%. So in the top 1% of papers published in major medical journals are these things that we should be able to trust. So he looked uh, um, across 1990 to 2003, and there are only 115 articles across the whole medical literature that were cited more than 1,000 times. And about 50 or 49 of those were actually evaluating healthcare treatments, and 45 out of those 49 claimed the treatments were effective. Um, and what he then did is say, well, let's look at what happens as more evidence evolves. If you get, as if you get new studies coming out, do they confirm or refute what the original paper said? And by 2004, five out of the six non-randomized studies and nine out of 39 randomized studies were already contradicted or found to be exaggerated. So even these breakthrough studies that everyone will cite and quote are often going to be overturned by new evidence as it evolves. And it suggests we have to look at bodies of evidence and we also shouldn't act too quickly in terms of innovation. Because other papers that John has done show that the first papers published in either a basic science or clinical world are always more positive than subsequent papers. So maybe we need two or three or four papers to get some sense about you know, whether the innovation we're interested in really will likely be, to be beneficial. Here's, given this is the, um, um, the, uh, part of the uh, academic health um, um, science network, um, here's also something that um, is to demonstrate that we're part of the problem. Yeah, so one of the issues is when you're on the BBC, you'll often have scientists saying, yeah, this was the best, yeah, this study will uh, lead to um, uh, 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 um, improvements in cancer care within a short, a short period of time, five years. Um, and if all of those statements accumulated since uh, the war on cancer was started uh, in the 60s, we'd have actually cured cancer by now. Most of them fall by the wayside. But one of the problems is that I mean, the academics often say it's terrible, it's the media people. They hype what we do. But actually, academics are very bad at hyping what they do as well. So this is a paper by Steve Volution and Lisa Schwartz. It was looking at academic, uh, the press releases from academic health science centers in the US. Uh, and they found that on average, uh, an academic health science center releases um, 49 press releases annually, one a week. 44% um, of those promote animal or laboratory research that we know is very unlikely to actually, at the end of the day, lead to direct improvements in clinical care. You know, one in a hundred will, which is great, but most of these things aren't going to be beneficial. But three quarters of them explicitly claimed relevance to, uh, to um, um, human health. So one of the best uh, ones I saw, now getting a bit worried about time, was um, on, my front, on the front paper of the local uh, uh, newspaper in Ottawa. It's obviously a slow news day, but there's a great story that marijuana might um, prevent Alzheimer's disease. Um, and there's a, it was basically the front page, it went on to the second page. And it's only when you got to the second page where the researcher said, we're really surprised there hasn't been more interest in this, although it could be because these, uh, this was done on, on, animal, on rats. Um, yeah, my guess is that what we'll find over time is that unfortunately, um, that marijuana doesn't make a big difference to Alzheimer's. Um, but this was really hyped up. Uh, in general, we, we don't, even when we talk about human studies, we don't talk about the study size. Most of it will be under, under um, um, powered. We don't quantify the results. We don't um, promote studies with the strongest designs. Um, um, so we're actually generating a lot of the problem. And it means that um, you shouldn't read virtually anything that ever gets reported in a newspaper or on TV as likely going to demonstrate the benefits that people are saying. So, um, 
the way we get around this is we use systematic reviews or other evidence-based guidance. Systematic reviews are a way of just pulling together the global evidence from around the world, repeated studies to say, are there consistent messages of benefit? Um, uh, and you know, all that a systematic review does is take a scientific approach to studying the research literature. So instead of using rats or humans as our object, uh, unit of observation, systematic review uses a, a study. Um, but it uses the same robust scientific ways. Um, and you can use systematic reviews across a broad range of areas. And guideline programs, the good ones, particularly NICE, very much base any guidance they do upon really high quality systematic reviews. Sometimes you can do a, um, a meta-analysis. Um, this is a statistical way of pooling together all of the studies. Um, I'm not going to talk you through this, um, but this was a, a meta-analysis looking at whether wearing stockings versus not wearing stockings could uh, reduce the, uh, the instance of symptomless deep vein thrombosis um, in long-haul flights. Um, so the question to you people in the room, your health message for the day is um, how many people are going on a long-haul flight in the next 12 months? Okay, you should wear a support stocking, all right? Very clear evidence, reduces symptoms to deep vein thrombosis. It probably is very unlikely it's gonna have a major impact on your healthcare, but there's virtually, I mean, there's no, it's gonna cost you sort of seven pounds to get a pair of these stockings. They're relatively comfortable. Um, your ankles are not gonna be swollen by the time you get off a plane, and it may prevent um, a deep vein thrombosis, a, 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 symptom, a, a symptomatic deep vein thrombosis uh, and pulmonary embolus. Um, but very clear evidence from a meta-analysis by pulling together the evidence from multiple studies. Uh, and this is an area where we've made huge gains in the last um, um, 20 years. Uh, so um, the Cochrane Club, I'm very involved in the Cochrane Collaboration. I'm one of the co-chairs of the organization at the moment. Um, but Cochrane is now involved in like 30,000 people from 120 countries, and they've completed 5,500 high-quality systematic reviews. So there's a lot of information out there that we can access that if you went back 20 years ago, we'd be struggling with. But actually, even better is we have you know, nice guidance or well-developed evidence-based guidelines where people have taken the systematic reviews and tried to think about contextualizing that within a UK population, within a UK healthcare system, to think about you know, what optimal care might look like. So now, increasingly, there really isn't any excuse about why we aren't being able to you know, think about what the evidence knowledge base is when we're thinking about implementation. We can also do systematic reviews of ways to improve quality of care. So um, I'm the Joint Coordinating Editor of the Cochrane Effective Practice and Organisation of Care Group, and we're the group that does systematic reviews of evidence about how to improve healthcare systems and uh, healthcare delivery. Um, and at the moment we've done, actually I think we're over 100 reviews now, um, and we have about 40 ongoing. And I'll just let you read the title very quickly so you've got a sense about the kind of things where we have evidence summaries um, available. So one of the issues is that if, in a trust, you're interested in should we do audit and feedback, and you said we're gonna to have to go and do our own systematic review, it'd be a huge amount of effort. Um, but actually, Epoch's done that, so you can say, well, let's go and look at some of the, if you like, the job that someone else has done, rather than thinking we have to do the heavy lifting ourselves. These are financial interventions and regulatory interventions. Okay. And this is a kind of, um, um, uh, this is what you find. Um, there are now 140 randomized controlled trials of audit and feedback. They show that on average, you get about a 4% absolute improvement in quality of care, with an interquartile range from one to 16%. The question is not, does audit and feedback work? It does, in general. The question now is how, under what circumstances, can we use audit and feedback to see if we can get close to the 16% improvement rather than the 4% the, the, uh, the improvement? If you look at education meetings, again, um, uh, um, 81 trials, about 6% improvement, a large interquartile range. Then look at financial incentives. So the poster child of healthcare policy in the US, and to some extent in the UK, um, by 2011, uh, there's only three randomized controlled trials of di changing different reimbursement mechanisms. A huge amount of the discourse around whether we should use pay performance has been on sort of um, economic uh, normative models about how people should respond to incentives rather than empirical evidence of if we give people incentives, do they change their performance? Look at hand hygiene. The, um, um, the, the, uh, uh, um, 
I think I'll make it. That's good. I'm, get, I'm getting the, the 10 minutes signal. I think I'll make it. Um, yeah, the poster child of patient safety. By 2010, only one randomized controlled trial about how to improve hand hygiene. Lots of papers that have report actually not very good evaluations. Uh, and this is an area we still don't know how to actually address. Um, yeah, in some areas we've done a lot. In other areas, yeah, we'll come on later to the fact that physicians in my hospital are not great at washing their hands. And I'm sure that in a number of the settings that you work in, um, some or all of the professional groups will not be as good as you'd like. What we can also do if you've got a systematic review is say, well, you know, is there any, does a systematic review allow us to understand under what circumstances we'll get a large effect? So in the epoch audit feedback review, we found that large effects were seen if baseline compliance was low. So in other words, if someone's baseline compliance is maybe 20% with guidance, you're more likely to get an effect and you feed that back to them than if their performance was maybe 80%. And the idea there is that actually we often have internal targets that we're trying to meet. And if your target is sort of 60 or 70% and you're achieving 20%, that's a much more powerful incentive to think, I need to change what I do. But if your target is, say, 85% and you're achieving 80%, you might think, well, actually, you know, maybe that's not too bad compared to the other priorities I've got. If the source of the audience feedback was the supervisor or the colleague, if it's provided more than once, if it's delivered in both verbal and written formats, and if it included both explicit targets and an action plan. The last bullet point is something that psychology would say, psychological theory would say, is a key component of audience feedback. But most studies that have been developed by healthcare organizations, or where audience feedback has been developed by healthcare organizations, don't have these. So here we have something where if we went to psychology, they'd say, well, this is how you design audience feedback to have a maximum effect. But um, when we just design this in terms of our you know, grassroots, let's try to see what we do, we often don't you know, use or, or optimize the audience feedback given what the current evidence base shows. So just to summarize this bit, the results of individual studies need to be interpreted alongside the totality of evidence, in other words, systematic reviews. Um, and we really need to avoid uh, an emphasis on individual studies. So again, if you're in a management position and someone comes in and says, this has been a great paper in New England Journal of Medicine that shows we should do this, say, that's really interesting, is there a systematic review? Okay, because the single study is likely to be misleading or not tell you the, 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 the truth. Um, there's substantial evidence on the effects of some implementation interventions. The average effects are often modest. One of the things when I still say order and feedback leads to about a 4% improvement, people say, ah, well, that's not very much. You know, it's a lot of effort to get a 4% improvement. If you were living, if you were working in Walmart, and you could say, well, by doing this, we'll get a 0.5% improvement to our productivity, people would be, love this. And so we have this real issue that people want a solution that will actually take us from maybe 60% to 100%, as opposed to, yeah, the way the world works is marginal benefit. So actually, if we can get an improvement from 60 to 64% with a relatively cheap intervention, that's worth having. Then we can work out how we get from 64 to 66%. But yeah, we're not going to find a magic bullet that will solve all of our problems. So let's of the, yeah, let's of the margins improve the quality of care. And the key, both research and service challenge, is how to optimize interventions and tailor um, interventions to the context. So I want to move on a little bit now. That was kind of what, what is the knowledge that we should be thinking about if we want to do uh, um, you know, quality improvement implementation. The next set of slides is, is very brief, and again, this could be expanded, but it's the idea of how do organizations establish systems and infrastructure that actually allows them to be good users of knowledge. Again, in the UK, you are much further ahead of the world because of the electronic library of health that you have. But you know, the, question, the question I'd have is, are your organizations systematically um, using evidence to inform what they do? And if not, how could they do better? So I would argue, and I really don't like the terminology, knowledge management is a fundamental challenge for healthcare organizations wishing to use evidence. And we need to develop a knowledge infrastructure of services and processes. Um, in a Canadian setting where we don't have an electronic library of health, although I think some of these things would apply here, some of the things we've talked about are the need for a knowledge intelligence service. We know that over the next um, um, 10 years in Canada, there's going to be a real issue, uh, particularly in my province, about the management of, of basically um, um, you know, those very high cost patients with complex multiple mobilities that are going in and out of hospital all the time that I think you have here. Do we have in my hospital an intelligence service where so, you know, a librarian is routinely trying to identify what the research evidence is telling us about this as a problem? 
or do we wait and hope that a manager or a clinician is going to find something uh, to come forward? Yeah, you know, there are things on the agenda of any sort of organization that are likely to be there for the next three to five years where it might be useful to get just a drip, drip, drip. Here's a study that's come out of this area that might just help people think about this in a different way or to, to be challenged to think about it further. You could think about a rapid synthesis service. So, um, you know, um, um, we really need to know about uh, whether creating a short stay, uh, um, uh, 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 a spillover ward for our emergency room is going to reduce waiting times in emergency. That was a real problem that we had in our hospital. And we did a systematic, or we did a rapid synthesis within eight weeks, uh, and pulled together what systematic reviews were there in any primary studies. And there was sufficient signal to say it's worthwhile to do this even though the, the, the benefits were not as clear as we'd like them to, but within the policy context, having done a very rapid synthesis allowed us the, our, 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 our senior management to say, okay, we're going to invest in this, but it also said, well, we need to monitor what we're doing to see whether we're going to get the benefit we do. Um, yeah, are the requirements for statements about evidence considered in high-level policy documents? In the Ontario Ministry of Health, uh, any cabinet paper has to say what evidence was considered in the development of this policy brief. Could say none. Doesn't say you have to do it, but actually sort of having that, I think, is a signal that this is something that we anticipate as a norm rather than something that's a kind of an add-on. So if you're interested in thinking about this in your organization, the Canadian Health, uh, um, Health Services Research Foundation has now changed itself to the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement, has a resource which is called Is Research Working For You? And it's basically a self-assessment tool. And it's structured about you know, how good are organizations for acquiring knowledge, assessing knowledge, adapting knowledge, and applying knowledge. It, you know, it, it may be kind of interesting to sort of think about, you know, take this from our organization, is this something we're good at or not? If you're doing great, that's brilliant. Uh, and certainly things like ability to acquire research should be easier in the UK than in Canada. But um, um, you, know, you might want to use that as a way of playing with it. It basically, uh, and each of these areas gives you a series of questions. You know, so do we have skilled staff for research? You know, a lot of healthcare organizations have medical librarians. Do we actually use them in a way that's maximizing their skill set? I suspect not in many cases. Um, OK. We're going to come back to the knowledge to action cycle. Um, um, I've got three minutes. Uh, I mean, basically, what we've talked about here so far is this area. And it's largely saying, what are the knowledge tools that, or, or it's largely arguing that healthcare professionals, and healthcare systems, and managers should be using knowledge tools rather than primary research. And the knowledge tools would be evidence based guidelines, policy documents, and patient decision aids for patients, um, rather than sort of uh, uh, taking on the weight of the world and saying we're going to assess whether uh, the primary research is good, use these tools here. This then is the outside circle, is the action circle, and it start, it's, it's basically about the application of knowledge. Developing nice guidelines is not sufficient to make sure they actually enter practice. So what can healthcare systems do to try and improve that? And it's arguing for a stepwise approach. Um, and uh, uh, um, you know, you, in general, start here. The action cycle would be, could be you, know, you start because you identify a problem. We had an asthma death in emergency. We need to think about whether we have you know, our systems for, for, for looking after adult asthmatics in emergency you know, sufficient, are the things we should be doing better. Um, it could be that you had a, um, um, a, uh, uh, an audit that showed that actually your sort of um, diabetic foot care is not as good as you, you might want it to be. Or you may find that there's new knowledge. So you know, nice guidance on X comes out. You know, is, you know, let's actually think about whether um, and this is something that would actually you know, we should act upon. I think, yeah, so you, there are many reasons why you might want to start to think about change processes. Um, the, you know, the, the next step is after actually adapting knowledge to local context. And the idea here is just kind of understanding what the implications of the knowledge might be in your context. And, you know, can you just take the evidence wholesale or do you have to adapt it in certain ways? Uh, and I'm not going to talk about this much, but it may require additional data collection to assess the applicability of knowledge to local context. So yeah, if you're interested in, say, sort of antibiotic resistance and there's guidance coming out from the uh, um, British Society of Microbiology, if there is such a thing, um, um, you might want to know whether you know, the kind of patterns of antibiotic resistance that you're seeing in your organization are sufficiently similar um, to, the, to, to those that are being reported elsewhere in the studies that have informed guidance to think about whether we should actually follow that guidance or not. OK? So often you might need to do additional um, data collection to assess the applicability of knowledge to local context. And there's really good examples, even at the uh, local organizational level, of doing, in effect, mini organizational level HTAs. 
So what would this actually mean for us? So a um, colleague in McGill at University um, um, Academic Health Science Centre um, actually does um, um, health technology assessments to inform their senior management team where they'll take maybe national guidance or uh, provincial guidance and say, well, actually, what does it mean for us? And doing all of this isn't going to make a huge amount of difference uh, in our hospital setting, given the other priority we need to, do, to, to, uh, uh, to deal with. And it may require modification of recommended actions based upon uh, these considerations. So we're really going to focus more on um, yeah, the rest of or these sort of areas of the cycle next, where um, the, there's kind of a lot of work to be done. But it's to sort of highlight, actually, um, yeah, I think if a piece of if a nice guideline comes across your desk, there is an argument to sort of say, well, let's actually think about this and think about how we're currently doing. Is this a sufficient importance or priority for us to take it forward? Do our patient uh, population or the, or the organizational issues allow us to easily do what the guidance suggests? Um, do we have to think about modification? Um, as we go forward. So just um, in summary, implementation is about ensuring that stakeholders are aware of and use research evidence to inform their decision making and actions. Implementation science is the scientific study of implementation. Um, and we need to bring together these three different types of knowledge. And my guess, certainly in my country, is we're very good at this area. We're less good at bringing these together. And I think the challenge for healthcare systems is how do we you know, systematically make sure we're using the best of this knowledge. But I'd argue, and will argue through the day, that adapting a systematic approach will likely uh, enhance the uh, success of implementation. And the knowledge to action cycle, it's a useful tool. It's a way of just structuring thinking. You may have a different one. It doesn't really matter. But it actually is something that sort of uh, encourages you to think about this in a systematic way. So I'm going to pause, which is good for me. Um, and we've got, we want you to talk a little bit now. So Justin's going to introduce um, the, uh, uh, the case studies. Right. So the idea, um, um, as Jeremy mentioned earlier, is we've got some sessions that are more lecture-based and some more interactive. And within these more interactive bits, we'll be giving you two types of scenarios that we'll be using throughout the day. Um, and the idea here is that in this first session, we want you to think about how you would tackle either hand hygiene or improving hand hygiene or improving diabetes care um, in pairs. And really this is just to, to recognize that you know, you're each bringing a wealth of experience and knowledge to the table to, to today and really to get a sense of how do you have any experience in this to, to begin with um, and if so, how have you tackled these things in the past and if not, how would you tackle them and, and to just get you to think about that in pairs. Um, so the idea here is choose one of the two scenarios and um, in your packs, you should have something that is headed by worksheets, session two, case studies. So start with that first page, and in pairs, select one of the two scenarios. So the first one is um, hand hygiene and hospital staff. And really, the background here will be no doubt familiar to you. So this is uh, healthcare-associated infections are uh, you know, a top 10 cause of hospital deaths worldwide. Um, hand hygiene um, is, uh, is effective and cost-effective, but adher adherence rates are low. And so the question is, how would you, if you were tasked to do this, how would you actually go about improving uh, the implementation of um, hand hygiene practices in a hospital? Or you could choose um, a, a primary care-based um, scenario around diabetes care. So the background here is the most recent national diabetes audit in the UK suggests that um, patients aren't necessarily reaching um, guideline-recommended targets in terms of um, glycemic control, blood pressure, cholesterol, and even fewer are meeting all three targets. And there seems to be evidence that the care process is underlying the, those, those targets are, are plateauing. And that's evidence, for example, from a study that, um, that was conducted out of Newcastle a few years ago showing that um, out of the 99 practices that, that, looked, that they looked at across the UK, 73% of patients received general education. Only half with a, B, a raised BMI got weight advice in the past 12 months. Um, Two thirds received self-management advice. 60% or 59% were prescribed even when they were above target um, for HbA1c and even less for, for blood pressure. So the, the question here is, based on these two um, scenarios, choose one and, and just have a discussion in pairs on how you would go about tackling that. Um, so we'll give you about 15 minutes to do that and then we'll, 15, 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll have a, a sort of feedback session of if anyone wants to say anything from their particular groups. So we'll, we'll let you have that discussion, thanks. 
Um, we don't have time to do a sort of table by table sort of um, feedback. So what we're looking for are just sort of people would be willing, you know, two or three examples on either uh, from either issue about sort of you know, what your conversation was about, what kind of approaches you thought might be useful. So um, um, who actually who who talked about the hand hygiene example? Put your hands up. Okay. So um, anybody wanting to sort of um, uh, uh, tell us uh, um, you know, what you thought in terms of the approaches you might take? There's someone on that, that back table. Sorry, yes. Uh, uh, there's a microphone so that we can capture this. So, so if you don't volunteer, I'm going to point at people. So um, yeah, I, you can't escape. Yep. Can you hear? Well, one of the things we talked about was the need to do a review of the evidence to find out what worked. So to find out what, were the, what studies had been done to show what generated a high level of hand hygiene and um, what didn't. OK, so that's good. Um, can tell you from the EPOC review there were four studies, um, only one randomized control trial, uh, and there's really even there's not a lot of evidence out there that tells you sort of what would be good or bad. Lots of good ideas, improving patient um, ha um, hand hygiene culture, other things, but very little robust evidence about what would be useful. So, but but uh, absolutely good starting point. Okay, other people doing hand hygiene. Hi. Um, we talked about the fact that you have to acknowledge that you've got to constantly reinforce and change the message. So even if the evidence doesn't change, the way that you present it to clinicians or practitioners and to the public has to change, otherwise it becomes wallflower, uh, wallpaper rather, and that we have staff turnover. So you've got, it's a constant reinforcement, constant audit, recycle, feedback. So it's a constant process that you've got to embed. Yep, good. Other ideas? Yep. Our little group thought that a, a hospital is a very large place, and so there'll be big differences in the challenges in hy hand hygiene practices in our patients, in the wards, in uh, theatres, and different kinds of wards, different kinds of our patients. So the first thing to do would be to actually go and have a look and see what the problems are in, in the various areas. And then that might suggest opportunities for improvement. In, uh, when you say C, do you mean to audit hand hygiene rates or to also do more in terms of trying to get beyond just straight audit data? Well, you, you want to see what, what the opportunities for improvement are. So you right. want to see where hand hygiene practices are not being observed and then try and understand why they're not being observed. And then you can think about what uh, interventions could improve them. So there, there may be barriers. You know, in a, in a children's ward, a mother might come in with a baby in her arms and a, another toddler. Like, how are they going to wash their hands? <laughs> okay, good. If it's the policy to have wash, for patients to wash their hands as they enter the ward. Yep, okay, here. Hi, we thought um, many clinical areas you could make use of secret shoppers because there are lots of people visiting. There are physios, there are pharmacists, there are porters, there are all sorts of folks. Uh, and you could have a system whereby they could just anonymously, if necessary, uh, indicate which were the areas that seemed to have good levels of hygiene. Mm -hmm. So I think to some extent both what you and Mike um, are saying, I mean, there's an issue about identifying where the problems are. I think then there's a kind of, okay, what do you do once you've identified that problem that in the you know, surgical ward five compared to surgical ward four is much worse. So, so did you also talk about, kind of, I mean, that, that was, you know, initially it was about detection, but do you also think about sort of solutions? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I'm an ex-medical director <clears throat> and my only sanction is to suspend somebody, and I'm not going to suspend somebody because they're not washing their hands. So uh, there's the carrot and stick aspect to it, and the bottom line of it is if the employer says that this is what you do, uh, then that is should be enforced. Uh, so that's the stick aspect of it. The carrot is a demonstrable... Uh, uh, identification on the wards or clinical areas when your last C. diff case was, when your last mm -hmm. uh, MRSA case was, and if uh, and you have a competitive element. 
Yeah, and some of those also would be the consequences, so demonstrating that you know, actually yeah, we have been able to reduce our C. diff uh, rates or whatever. Um, you know, so it's, I mean, some of the problems around professional behaviours is it's often not visible what the solution, you know, what the response is. So in the diabetes care, you know, sort of basically treating people, not treating people with their cholesterol, it's very unlikely GP is going to know that actually, you know, Justin didn't have an MI because I did this. So there's, yeah, you know, some of those things also about the observability of, you know, the, you know, the behaviour change that actually you did achieve something useful. Okay, okay, one more, and then we're going to the diabetes. Yes, we did think about the evidence as well, but also in terms of the evidence for hand hygiene and what difference it could make to educate people in that way. Um, we think that it needs to be embedded into routine, so it needs to be within training and um, in education, and also making sure that the resources are available for people to wash their hands routinely. Good, good. Okay, um, was it hand hygiene or diabetes? Very quickly, hand hygiene, because we do need to do diabetes. Uh, hi. Uh, my name is uh, Polly from Spearhead Interactive. Uh, we're based in Millsborough. We uh, develop uh, online 3D services uh, and solutions uh, for business education and public sectors. Um, and uh, I was just uh, thinking about the educating and the visualization technique of, how you, um, of why you want to um, wash your hands. Uh, and I had an example. Uh, this was a biometric fingerprint scanner user manual that we created for IEVO. And it's basically, this, this is in running in real time, uh, online on our mobile devices. And if you, for example, simulate um, the techniques um, of how you, wash the, how you wash your hands, and also you could potentially, for example, if you, if you have a scanner to detect the bacteria in your hands and use, for example, 3D projection to show it on the person's hand and say, oh, I missed a bit here, I should wash that further, you know, and see cause and effect, yep. um, you know. Brilliant, okay, we, we need to move on, because otherwise, who did diabetes? Yep, yep. Thank you. Uh, we talked about the fact that these measures were all process measures in primary care um, and that that was actually very often not particularly helpful uh, in terms of outcomes. Um, I th personally think that um, a lot of these measures have actually caused general practice to be somewhat uh, dumbed down and de-skilled in terms of uh, lacking professional accountability and that, that ought to be built into any newer measures. Okay. Other diabetes? Yeah. Hi. We kind of broke out of pairs and went into a group, so sorry about that. Um, I think the key thing we picked up was uh, the word general. It shouldn't be general education, it should be more specific, um, whereby you focus on a patient's particular needs rather than say, here is a leaflet, go away and read it. You actually monitor and measure more effectively. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other diabetes views? Yep. We uh, spend most of our time talking about developing a better understanding. So it's clearly an intractable problem. Things aren't changing. So what is it either about the professional community or the community of people with diabetes that mm. uh, we clearly haven't understood yet, despite having plenty of intervention already? And we did we did manage to hold back from just jumping in and wanting to do some more, mm -hmm. but only just. <laughs> okay, any other, any last diabetes? So I think that's kind of quite a nice sort of, I mean, I think we have chosen subjects which are, yeah, this, I mean, when I was in medical school in the late 70s, early 80s, I, don't, I mean, I think, yeah, they might, it's changed slightly, but in general, yeah, these would be on the on the on the horizon. These are kind of common intractable problems. We often think about sort of you know, really sexy, whizzy, innovative things that we try to change, but often healthcare systems are failing are just sort of really basic things that we've known for quite a long time. Uh, and I think then, you know, some, I mean, I think it came up in both the diabetes and the hand hygiene. You know, when you get to kind of quite intransigent problems, you know, maybe those are times where it's worthwhile investing in a, in a deeper dive to understand what's actually happening. Okay, that's a really good start, and we're going to come back to these examples through the day. And they're also chosen because I've been doing work on hand hygiene in Canada, and Justin's been doing hand hygiene, uh, sorry, diabetes work in, uh, in, in, in the Northeast. So you'll also get some sense at least of, about kind of some of the things that we've been finding. And certainly they chime, I think, with a number of things that you're raising already.